give me a minute here to get set up. <clears throat> How many of you were here last night? Okay, so there were some of us who weren't. Um, last night we uh, we watched the documentary Covenant and Controversy. Uh, it's it's the first part in a series of documentaries. The one last night was actually called The Great Rage. And um, I encourage you, we'll, we can give you some information uh, at the end of this of where you can, can find it and buy it. Buy d they have DVDs or uh, watch it online or whatever. But I just en encourage you, if you weren't here last night, um, to do what you can to to watch the documentary. I actually think that, that they might have it online. And uh, what, it, what it showed was um, really the, the history of, of the, the, the plight that the Jews, Jewish people have had to, to face, the persecution, um, the, the nations that have hated Israel, that have not just hated Israel, but, but even when the, uh, when the Jews were dispersed throughout the nations, they made some, um, some really strong points uh, in this documentary last night that it doesn't matter where they are, as history has shown in the earth that there has been persecution if the Jews are, are in the land or if they are dispersed through the nations. And so historians can can uh, look at, at what has happened through history and say, yeah, this has happened through history, but they don't really have an answer as to why has this happened and continually happened throughout history. So as, uh, as the body of Christ is a, a house of prayer, um, we just we feel like it, it is absolutely vital that we have understanding, especially in this hour of history, as the, the nations are raging ever more, as crisis is increasing, and Jesus said that it, it would at the end of the age, we, we feel like it is imperative that, uh, that the church has understanding and clarity and knowledge uh, for the sake of, of having an anchor of hope. And having uh, understanding as to what scripture says, not just that we would stand with Israel just from like a, a, a nationalistic level, but we would actually uh, root our hearts and connect our hearts in agreement to what God's word says and what is the, the et eternal purposes that are in Jesus's heart for, uh, for Israel and for the church. And the good news is that, uh, that the two destinies are connected, Israel and the, and the church. And so, um, have we passed out notes? Let's, let's go ahead and pass out some notes. Do we have them? Yeah. Okay. And uh, as, <coughs> as you're doing that, I'm just going to pray real quick. So, Father, we just thank you for this time today. We just ask you, Lord, that you would, Holy Spirit, would you anoint your word? Let it, uh, let it impact our hearts, God. Let it enlighten our spirits as to what you say and what you, you feel and what you desire for uh, the mystery that you said is, is Israel. Lord, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're just uh, passing out some notes here. Um, and I just want to want to share a little bit about where we're going. We're going to teach. This is this is one session of of notes, but it's really going to be split up into to two times. So I'm going to teach through this uh, this fir first portion, and then we're going to take a little break, and then um, we're going to come back and talk about uh, the salvation of Israel. And the, the, the role of, of the church, how, 
how are we as the, the church, the international Gentile believers supposed to, to respond to, to this issue? So, so amen, I'm just going to j- jump right in here. Um, so uh, this is the plans of God for, for Israel and the church. And as I said, that, that the two destinies are connected. And so we want, want to, to understand what God's plan is concerning Israel. And if you want, you could uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. Now, um, the, the issue of Israel is central to the gospel. I really believe that uh, it's not a fringe issue. It's not just something kind of on the outskirts of, of Christianity, but it's, it's really a, a gospel issue. Um, and I say this because uh, it's all throughout Scripture, but in Romans uh, chapter 11, really 9, 10, and 11, uh, the Apostle Paul brings up this entire issue of the the centrality and the the um, the why is Israel connected very even very centered in the heart of God in all of the plans of God and the plans of the church so there's a there's I forget the the uh, famous saying that's like in um, I forget it talks about things that are essential and things that are kind of secondary. I would say that, that the issue of, of Israel is an essential, central issue that the church cannot ignore. And those aren't my words, because in Romans chapter 11, Paul uh, starts talking about this issue with, a, with an urgency in his heart and uh, a, a, like a, a, a necessity... Uh, for the church to understand and cooperate with God's plans for Israel's salvation. Now, uh, Paul warns in in Romans 11 that uh, he warns the church against being three things, really being ignorant or being arrogant towards the Jews and the mystery of Israel, and the church, and the plans of God. So he says, uh, well, I, I put the scriptures down here. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. This is the truth that some of, of the branches were broken, broken off, unbelieving Israel, and you, Gentile believers, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others. All right. I'm assuming we're probably all Gentiles in this room. Um, And then he goes on to say, Now do not be arrogant to the branches. Do not become proud, but fear. Then he goes on in uh, verse 25 and 26. He says, I do not desire that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Talking about uh, the, the mystery of Israel. I put uh, paragraph B here. God's mystery refers to his plan that he hid through the ages until he revealed it to the apostles. We must understand the Lord's plans in order to cooperate with them. So Paul says, he says, I, he says you should not be arrogant and you should not be ignorant of the mystery. And what is the mystery? Paul said that, that blindness, spiritual blindness... <coughs> in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in to the kingdom. Then he says, and so all Israel will be saved. Those are some massive concepts that Paul was, was uh, unfolding here. So, But he, he puts this warning in that we're not to be ignorant concerning God's plans, and we're not to respond with, with an arrogant heart that, 
oh, you Jews were broken off and, and we were grafted in and salvation's come to us Gentiles, but we are to actually respond with the fear of the Lord and understanding the mercy of God in the, in the so- sovereign plan of the, the entire thing. God's original intent, paragraph C, for, was for Israel to have the primary leadership role in bringing God's salvation to all nations. And there's going to be uh, lots of scripture references. We don't have time to go through, and I don't even, there's so much in the Bible. So go through your uh, on your own time, and I just encourage you to, to study this. Don't just take someone's word for it who stands behind a podium and a pulpit Actually give yourself to searching out the scriptures. Uh, but Israel had, had in the original intent in God's heart, I believe scripture uh, shows that Israel had a primary leadership role. This was their national calling to, to bring the, the gospel, God's salvation to the nations and uh, the good news is that we, we look at Israel now today, we look at, at uh, most of, of what's happening with the Jews, and we, we would say, well, that's, that's obviously not happening. The good news is that, that uh, it is in the Lord's heart that he is going to restore that primary leadership role that what Paul was saying is, is it has been for a time given to the Gentiles until the, the fullness of, of the Gentiles comes in, the, the message of salvation has come to them. But there's, there's coming a time when that primary leadership role is going to come back upon Israel and they're going to bring the gospel to the nations in the millennium. It says that all, all the nations are going to be gathered to them and they're going to go up and the Lord is going to teach his ways from the mountain of Jerusalem, Isaiah 2 talks about this. So God's uh, redemptive plan from the very beginning has been directly tied to, not just to Israel, just simply in a, in a way of, of, of nationalism or just to a, a piece of land in the earth, but it's, it's actually been tied to Israel loving and receiving Jesus as their Messiah, and uh, and operating again in the primary leadership role that God placed upon Israel as a as a, a nation, as God's people, as the apple of His eye. <clears throat> um, and so there's so many questions that, and so many opinions in the body of Christ. When it comes to this issue, this is one of the most divisive, um, controversial, politically incorrect issues that you can preach on in, in church today. And I, I encourage you again, go back and, and watch the documentary, and it shows examples throughout history and even currently today of the, the controversy that is centered around uh, not just Israel and, and Jerusalem and the land, but even the Jewish people who have been, been dispersed through the nations. The Holocaust happened without a Jewish state. Jews were scattered throughout Europe, and yet something like the Holocaust was still possible. So uh, there's so many, many opinions, there's so much controversy that is around this one issue, and I I dare say that that this will be the end-time litmus test for the church, is what is going to happen uh, with the nation of Israel, and how the church is going to respond in the heart of God, And, and we're going to unpack uh, a little bit more of what Paul was, Paul's, is highlighting in Romans, because this is a, a, a glorious, victorious, redemptive storyline, hopeful storyline, even though there are, are, there's much uh, 
trouble and distress and even suffering that is involved in it. God has a, a plan for salvation and redemption. And the, again, the two destinies of the church are, are connected. If God has a, a, a destiny and p- covenantal promises for Israel, that means that the, the church is connected into those promises. And the church has to, to, to understand what he's saying in, in order to actually cooperate and agree with, with God's heart in that. <clears throat> so, so, uh, so what does scripture say about the covenants, about the land, about the people, about the church, all of these things that are, there's so much con- controversy over. And I just want to say that, that we want, I, this is my prayer, that, that my heart would be burdened for the things that burden God's heart, and that we w- that I would connect into the storyline of of Scripture. What does the Bible say about God? And really, the the issue in all of this, and we're going to go here into uh, to to the ever an everlasting covenant. The issue is that God is a covenant-keeping, faithful God who keeps his promises. The questions I want, want, want to, to ask today is, has he broken his promise? Has he said something that he didn't mean? Has he just spoken just in kind of, of allegorical spiritual language? Or does he actually mean what he said Will he keep his promise? Is he faithful? And those are those are I think the the uh, that's what I want to address here. So, Lord help us. So God's plans for for Israel and the church. It, this is about an everlasting covenant. Uh, the issue of Israel again is central to the gospel storyline. God's dealings with with Israel throughout the ages demonstrate his faithfulness to his promises and how far he will go for the sake of redemption and salvation. You look at the history of Israel, you look at the history of the Jewish people, you look at the history of Jerusalem, and it is astonishing that there is even that people group. There is even, uh, there is even the Jews, there is even a state of Israel today. Jerusalem has, has been uh, sieged, has gone through sieges of the city, I think 28 times throughout history. It's been demolished, burnt down. Like the people of the Jews have been dispersed. There's been so much turmoil that has been centered on that tiny little piece of land and, and this special people, and it is a mystery in God's heart. It is a mystery even to just our own natural minds of, yet they're still standing. How are they still standing? How, how has all of this come to be? And there, there's even a, a state of Israel in the earth today. And so this all started, well, even before Abraham... God promises, uh, God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve. He creates man, the knowledge, uh, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know the storyline, what happens. They break the covenant, <coughs> the, the curse and the fall. And at the very beginning, the, the very start of the entire storyline God in his mercy, Genesis Genesis chapter 3, he promises that through through Adam's seed, through through the the seed of the image bearers, that God is is going to to raise up one who will, though, though the devil, the serpent, would bruise his heel, he's going to crush his head. 
And this is at the, the very beginning of the storyline. That means that forever, forever and ever and ever into all of eternity future, that, that God connected his heart to a human storyline, to a, a physical reality uh, on the earth, because forever and ever and ever, we know the story, God becomes a man in flesh, and forever Jesus will remain a, a human man, a real Jewish man. He, he did not shed his, his body and just descend into heaven as this like ethereal ghost spirit being. He is a real Jewish man, and he is not just any man, not just a good leader, a good rabbi, a good teacher, a good prophet, but he is the king of the earth. And so all of, all of this, uh, the entire storyline, the entire gospel storyline is Israel-centric, and it is centered around a real Jewish man coming back to the earth to rule the earth. That's not a politically correct, like that's, that's the most controversial thing that you can have. You could say, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Uh, so from the very beginning, though, this was in the storyline. So what I want to do is, is, is uh, my prayer is that, that we would begin to trace the, the promise, that promise. So connect the dots. The very beginning, Genesis, this is in the heart of God, that, that there would be a, a real man that would, would be Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. And he is going to, to uh, it's not plan B, this is plan A from the very beginning, that Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign. So I want to connect, uh, as we start looking into to some of this stuff on the, on the covenantal promises, that, keep that reality, that's the dream that is in God's heart. This is not just a, a political uh, issue, it's not just an, an issue about a physical piece of land, but ultimately this is an, the issue is about this man Jesus receiving all that he willfully, voluntarily was, was slaughtered upon the cross for. The dream in his heart, this, that's what this is about. He is, he is filled with zeal, filled with desire that's burning in his heart for, to see the fullness of, of, of all of those promises and for, for all that he died upon, upon the cross to receive. That's Psalm 2. The nations, God's promises Jesus, the nations shall be your inheritance. Ask of me, and I will give them to you for your possession. This is reality, guys. So Genesis uh, 15. Abraham. I'm just going to turn here. Um, Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to go try and go through some of this pretty quickly here. Um, God makes a, 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 a promise, a covenant to Abraham in this chapter. And uh, we know the storyline that, that Abraham had no, no offspring and he desired a, that there would be an, an heir for his household. And what God, what God uh, through the storyline of, of Ishmael and, and uh, Isaac and Jacob and Israel, there is a promise that comes, and this is, is the promise. Um, uh, let's see, where do I want to start here? Well, so let, let, me, let me set this up. That God comes to make this covenant to Abraham. And there's, this is a weird picture of, of what happens. He tells Abraham in uh, verse 7, I'm the Lord who, 
who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them, brought him all these, cuts them in half, and he lays, he, he basically makes an aisle with these, these, animals that have been cut in half this is like a really graphic <coughs> like thing that's been going on here so he, he he lays like two aisles down or two rows down and and there's like an aisle in the middle and um it says that the birds of prey come abraham starts driving them away and as the sun was going down a deep sleep falls upon abram now, this is interesting. When God is making the covenant with Abram, <laughs> Abram's not even awake. It says that a deep sleep falls on Abram, verse 12, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord says to Abram, who's asleep, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, as they were in, in the land of Egypt, they got thrown into to slavery. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. They shall come back here in the fourth generation. And then verse 17, when the, the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between these pieces. God, God comes as, a, as a, a flaming torch, as a smoking fire pot. He passes in between these, these animals that had been uh, cut in half and laid these two rows. And then he says this. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Cadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now, if you, if you go study historically what all of that means, it is a massive piece of land, far bigger even than, than the boundaries of Israel today. So God makes this covenant to Abraham, and uh, as, as if to say, point A here on page, page two, the Abrahamic covenant was an ongoing, unconditional, uh, one-sided promise made, to God, made by God to Abraham and his physical descendants, ultimately will be through son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. Now, why is this important? Because uh, in this picture, we see that God is not just, it's not just a, a, a legal agreement between two parties like it would be in the, in the Mosaic Covenant. It was not just a conditional promise, but it was something in the heart of God where he was saying, Abram, I will do this. I will give you this land to you and to your, to your offspring, and they will possess a, a literal, specific piece of land. And God, as if to, to, to like pledge his life almost on it, walks through these, there's this picture of Abram asleep, and God is walking through this, row of dead animals, and it's, a, it's, a, it's as if he's, like, saying, if this does not to come to pass, like, like let it be that, that God, that I would die. Like, he is so serious about it that, that he is saying, this is my promise. And uh, so point B, not only was the covenant made to Abraham, Abraham and his descendants, but it was also a promise to receive a promised land from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River to the river of Egypt in the southwest. 
Now, the Mosaic Covenant. <clears throat> the Mosaic Covenant was a, a two-sided legal agreement. This is different from what God said to Abraham. He comes to Moses, and uh, between it was two-sided legal agreement between the Lord and all of Israel. God repeatedly highlighted his desire for a people to walk in covenantal love and obedience to him. And largely the covenant was this. If you will, then I will. And there, there's like way too much scripture to go through in Exodus with the Mosaic Covenant. But again and again, he's saying, if you will, if you will follow me, if you will hear my words, if you will obey me, then this will happen. There will be blessing and promise that will come upon you. But it was a conditional thing in that if you won't do this, then this is what I, God, will do. And he goes through and he, he, he actually says that, talks about curses that will come upon them. And, um, and so we, but we see a picture here from the very beginning Deut- in Deuteronomy 6 that, that this was in the Lord's heart, that the chief aim in God's heart concerning Israel was not just that they would simply just obey a set of rules, but that they would love God with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their mind, and all their strength. That's what Jesus quotes, the great commandment. He's like, you guys know what it is. It was way back in the day, Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God. So this this desire that was burning in the Lord's heart was uh, to demonstrate his his relentless, jealous love to have a people for his own possession, to, uh, to demonstrate his, his zeal that Israel would be saved by grace through faith in Jesus, and for them uh, to love him completely in return. And here is, is, is the, the crux, that it wasn't just that, but it was still connected that they would do it in a specific way land that God promised to give to Abraham. And uh, it says Deuteronomy chapter 4, I put the scripture there, when you're in tribulation and all these things come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you. And this is what it, what, what it says, or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. <clears throat> Paul went on to say in, uh, in Galatians that the promises that were made to Abraham were made to Abraham and to his offspring, and that not just all of his offspring, but to Isaac. He says, it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, in other words, Abraham's other sons, and Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 9, but referring to one and to your offspring. Now, uh, it says it, Paul goes in it more in Romans 9, but ultimately that storyline, the lineage, you can trace it to the fulfillment in Christ. But then he goes on to say, this is, Paul says, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant that was previously ratified by God. God staking like his life basically on this, this thing. I will, this will come to pass. So as to make the promise void, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And so the crux of, of the storyline is that Israel's residency or, or uh, occupancy of the land, that promised land, was dependent upon their covenantal obedience. This is why it was, was a conditional covenant in, to, Mo, to, uh, to Moses and the people. However, God never nullified his promises to Abraham when he made the Mosaic covenant. Does that make sense? He doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to make a covenant with Abraham. All right, Abraham, Israel's going through like a tough time and 
they're in slavery, and okay, um, I'm going to raise up Moses, and I'm going to make a new covenant, and now we're going to do just new thing, and this covenant is going to going to nullify the covenant to Abraham. In the covenant to Abraham, I will give the land to, to your offspring, and you will possess it, and it comes with blessing and everything else that the Lord said. So uh, uh, on uh, page two here at the bottom, Paul taught that God's faithfulness was not nullified, this is the question, by Israel's disobedience. He is faithful, and all that he promised will come to pass. Jesus will save the people of Israel, fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, ultimately Israel, and demonstrate the fullness of his zeal toward Jerusalem as the the city of the great king. Which from the very beginning, the very beginning, Jesus chose Jerusalem as the place from which he would establish his throne and reign on earth says in, in Exodus chapter 15, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever and ever. Is this, is this starting to make sense? I, uh, my prayer is that, is that we would begin to, to see in the heart of God that he desires a dwelling place on the earth. It's not just a, a political issue again. It's not just a nationalistic issue. And, uh, and I say that because I think uh, a lot of the church says, yeah, we, I stand for Israel, we stand for Israel. We have a heart for Israel, but, but there's not a clear understanding when it comes to the actual storyline. And so we want to connect our hearts to, to the biblical storyline because of, of what, what Scripture says in the promise, promises of God. And because of, of what, it, what will come upon uh, Israel and in Jerusalem and all these things, we're going to talk about that more tomorrow morning. Um, and so we, we, have, we have the promise of Abraham, the covenant uh, to Abraham that was not nullified by the covenant to Moses. And then there's a, a no, another covenant, and it's a, the Div- Davidic covenant to David, King David, where God comes to King David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and uh, through the, the prophet Nathan, God reiterates the promise to the land made through Abraham. Again, he doesn't nullify what he said to Abraham. But the storyline begins to continue. And God, even again and again and again and again and again, says that I, I have not reneged on my promise. I have not nullified my promise. I have not done away with this covenantal promise, and this is why it comes down to an issue of the faithfulness of God. So he comes to David, and he promises something to David. And he says to David that, uh, 2 Samuel 7, I will make for you a great name, and I will, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them again, the same language again and again and again throughout Scripture, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And this is what he says to David, that David, your throne will be established forever. Isaiah 9 <clears throat> Of the increase of his government, the prophecy comes through Isaiah. We know this, this passage, especially going into the Christmas season, baby Jesus. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. This is what it says. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is not just a, a something that Paul, the Apostle Paul in Romans 11, 
kind of pulls out of thin air and is like, hey, this, is, this would be kind of a cool thing to happen. But this is in the heart of God. And again and again and again, it says the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. The Lord said that he is zealous for Jerusalem. Jeremiah 33, the, the prophecy comes, For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Then comes Luke chapter 1. The angel Gabriel. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is the the certain covenant to to David that, that God makes is that David, through your throne, There will come a man, one of your descendants. The Lord said to my Lord, is what David says. He prophesies this, Psalm 110. The most quoted psalm in all of the New Testament is that psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, Jesus again and again is like, what what in the world was David talking about? The apostles were like, what was David talking about? How could David say that this is his Lord? This was... The, the, the message, the apostolic message of the early church is not just God loves you and Jesus died for you, but it was actually this. This Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ who's going to return and sit on the throne of David and rule and reign from Jerusalem. And then they, that was the message that was preached when it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they cried out and asked, what must we do to be saved? Now, I haven't heard many of messages like this in, in most Sunday morning services. <clears throat> but God is faithful to, it, to his everlasting covenant. And I put, uh, there, I put down a chart on page uh, four, that kind of breaks all that down into a little bit of an easier way. Um, but then the, 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 there's the last covenant, and the new, it's the new covenant, right? And we tend to chalk all, all of these, these things up to just the new covenant and the old covenant, and we kind of mash up the covenant of Abraham and Moses and David and all these things, and God is done with the old He's done with the Old Testament. That's how many times do you hear, well, that's just the Old Testament. And uh, the reality is, is the promises that are through the storyline and the covenant, they are they're everlasting promises. Yeah, they're that are made in the Old Testament, and there are are Well, here, I'll just go through this. Through the new covenant, we see that God's ultimate intent in his covenantal promises was about much more than simply possessing land. The Lord will place, this is his promise, prophesied. The new covenant is not just in the New Testament. It's actually prophesied in scripture in the Old Testament. That the Lord will place his spirit, his words, his heart into Israel for the sake of salvation. The new covenant was inaugurated when Jesus, the son of God, the son of David, the holy one of Israel, voluntarily gave his broken body unto death on the cross that both Jew and Gentile would be saved by grace through faith through faith in Christ. The new covenant does not abrogate God's original plans to corporate Israel. Through Christ, Israel will be saved by love, for the sake of love, to serve and to love Jesus fully. 
And it's still connected specifically in the land that God promised to give them, which is what the covenant of David is, is all about. David will never lack a man to sit on his throne. There will be a Messiah who will come and will rule on the throne of David. And uh, it's through his lineage, David's lineage. Like, imagine that. They see Jesus. Like, I wonder if we'll see Jesus and we'll be like, huh, there's, there's Jesus and there's King David. He kind of has his chin. <laughs> like, he kind of has his features. And this is like the, the fiery uh, zeal and the reality that, was, that, 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 that Israel was looking for their Messiah. And they missed the plot. We want them to take passages like Isaiah 53, literal. He was bruised. He was broken. He was disfigured. Who's that talking about? We point. We say, well, this is Jesus. We want them to take those passages literal. But a lot of people, a lot of believers have trouble with the other passages and the prophecies taking them literally. Promises, Isaiah 62, Jerusalem will be a praise in the earth. Israel will be no longer termed forsaken or forgotten, but they will, shall be called Beulah and Hephzibah, the city of God's delight. For as the bride rejoices over the bridegroom, uh, so shall God rejoice over them. Is that allegorical or is that real? Is that literal? Um, all right, where am I? Ezekiel 37 highlights this new covenant. I'll take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will bring them to their own land, and one king shall be king over them all. I will save them again and again and again. This comes up again and again and again. I will save them. I will save them. Though ha they have rebelled against me, though I am their husband, though they have turned and served and worshiped false gods and idols, I will do this. And he says, uh, I will bring them back from the backslidings in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Behold, the days are coming, Jeremiah says, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Amen. We're going to uh, take a break here, and uh, <clears throat> come back, and, and we're going to talk about the salvation of Israel. We're going to talk about how all of that storyline God will bring to fulfillment. This is like, I so, I felt so much hope and like, like, ah, oh, this is like, this is awesome. And studying, uh, studying all of this. And so, all right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's just take a, let's take a tip.